Hi, this is Daniel Hutchins, and today I want to do a little something that I want to share to you guys. I want to do an article about the critics must be crazy. The Rise of Skywalker is the best Star Wars movie in the new trilogy. And this is from another site that I like to use called Forbes.com. Okay, so let the hate flow through you. Those are the words that Emperor Palpatine says to Luke Skywalker near the end of the Return of the Jedi. As Luke very nearly succumbs to the dark side by killing his father, Darth Vader, a.k.a. Anakin Skywalker, the phrase may as well be the tagline to various swaths of Star Wars fans at any given time. There seems to be a dedicated fandom in Star Wars Galaxy right now that simply relishes hating on anything and everything Star Wars. However, for the latest film, Star Wars Episode Nine: The Rise of Skywalker, that group apparently includes the critics. Film reviewers are tearing the movie apart for a whole variety of reasons. And while there's no accounting for taste, many of the reasons given simply don't stand up to scrutiny. To be fair, fans gave the film a B plus on cinema score, it was also lower than the previous Star Wars movies, so it's garnering plenty of disappointment all around. The Rise of Skywalker is not a perfect film, but it is not a 57% run on Rotten Tomatoes either. I enjoyed it a lot, even though I have my own complaints, which I'll get to in a separate review. Okay, so the critics must be crazy. It feels like only yesterday I was writing a similar piece about Netflix's The Witcher. In fact, it was like three days ago. Critics panned that show as well a bite for different reasons. Now that I've seen episode 9, I can wade into this debate as well. Why do critics hate Rise of Skywalker so much? What is it about the film? A film I found emotionally powerful and incredibly thrilling all at once that Rob's review is so terribly wrong. Well, a few key ideas keep floating to the top as you peruse their reviews. These seem to be A. Too much fan service. B. Too much nostalgia. C. That the film is too much of a retread of old ideas. And D. That the film somehow goes back on what we and Johnson did in The Last Jedi. That last one is the most interesting to me, though we'll examine all four. Many critics who love The Last Jedi, it was critical despite some of its glaring flaws, and currently it has a 91% on Rotten Tomatoes seem to despise from The Rise of Skywalker because they believe it ruins what Johnson started. Much like many fans hate The Last Jedi because it feels like it put a twist on so much of what J.J. Abrams started in The Force Awakens. But as a side note, I think all three films can work together as a cohesive whole, but it's certainly apparent that things would have been smoother and more coherent had the new trilogy's creators come up with a three-movie plot from the get-go, and everyone had been on board with the major details. Alas, for reasons we shall never understand, this was not the case. Still, Abrams did a terrific job, not only at tying the new trilogy together and landing a satisfying ending, he managed to weave together themes and events from the entire nine film series. This was no simple task. And there was no way every Star Wars fan and critic would be praised in the end. But Abrams pulled off something remarkable here. And he did it without ruining the legacy of The Last Jedi, despite many fans and critics alike thinking otherwise. These are the odd bedfellows detractors of The Last Jedi are gleeful over Rise because they see it as a renunciation of... Johnson Star Wars.
Critics who love The Last Jedi seem to think the same thing. I liked many things about The Last Jedi and soured on many others since I first saw it, but I think Abrams did a really good job at both giving the fans more of what they wanted and respecting what The Last Jedi did to, the, to change the Star Wars universe. The Last Jedi set up Rey's dark path perfectly, showing how drawn she was to the dark side while training with Luke. And while it fumbled the entire space chase sequence in Casino Planet, all the Luke, Ray, and Kylo Ray stuff was on point, and it fits perfectly with the final reveal of her true identity and the way everything plays out with Kylo Ren and Palpatine. Still, however, many disagree from the front rows. Matthew Lucas describes The Last Jedi as a film that fully reinvented Star Wars mythology in new and exciting ways and laid the groundwork for exploring uncharted territory within the Star Wars universe. This caused controversy, however, in the whole Not My Luke movement, which I found to be the weakest critique of the film, and so with Rise. Lucas writes, Director J.J. Abrams returned to wrap the fans in a cozy blanket of familiarity, throwing in everything but the kitchen sink to remind nostalgic fans of the classic films they loved as children. This, as a critique, only works if you believe that Johnson truly subverted expectations as much as we gave him credit for in 2017. It only works on top of that if you believe that Abrams really does wrap fans in a cozy blanket of familiarity, and that in doing so undermines The Last Jedi. The argument also relies on something very strange. The idea that giving fans the movie they want is somehow a bad thing. Familiarity, nostalgia, these become bad words in many critiques of the movie, as though fans should only ever have their expectations subverted. A little subversion goes a long way. We don't need to abandon everything that makes Star Wars what it is in order to appease the critics. It's a strange debate, however, after all, only one could say that Johnson undermined Abrams to begin with, dashing all he had planned with The Force Awakens into little tiny plot fragments. In any case, many critics seem to believe that Abrams tossed Johnson's bold new ideas for Star Wars into the trash bin of the familiarity and nostalgia, so if you didn't like The Last Jedi, you'll probably like Rise of Skywalker. I like them both in many ways, and found each, like The Force Awakens, possessed of its own set of flaws. And then as a writer that said, there's really no beating around the bush with it, J.J. Abrams' conclusion to... The Skywalker Saga is something of a mess, whereas Johnson's The Last Jedi had been daring, excited, and encapsulated everything that makes Star Wars great. The rise of Skywalker brings the trilogy to an end with a bland, dull, and very forgettable final entry. That's an interesting statement, however, while I'm by no means a huge detractor of The Last Jedi, I find myself never rewatching the film after seeing it in theaters once the initial glow had faded. I realize this something I didn't want to go see it again. It was too long, too much of the film plodded along, and the stuff I really liked only composed maybe half the movie, and the rest felt like wasted space. The Rise of Skywalker, on the other hand, has me itching for more. I want to go back and watch it again right away, far from bland, dull, and forgettable. It was constantly exciting, edge of your seat entertainment, and full of what makes Star Wars great. Isn't it odd that Critics seem to claim that The Last Jedi both subverted everything about Star Wars and encapsulated everything about Star Wars that makes it great. If, if familiarity and nostalgia are bad, what exactly does make Star Wars Star Wars? I would argue that Star Wars has always been about repeating forms. Anyone who complains that there are too many similarities between the new films and the original trilogy must have missed how this same storytelling device was used in the prequel trilogies. When critics argue that Rise is beholden to the past or not risky enough, they're asking for something that would defy everything about Star Wars up to this point. There are parallels in Rise to both Revenge of Sith and Return of the Jedi. 
the films that ended the first two trilogies. But rather than simply mirror those films, these parallels tie each of them together in really exciting ways. Spoilers below. The parallels I'm speaking of center mostly around Kylo Ren and Rey. Palpatine, yes, we discover that Rey is the granddaughter of the Emperor, who is hunting her down so that he can have her take his place as the leader Sith. This will allow him to inhabit her since all the past Sith will enter her like a vessel, which also explains why he wanted Luke to strike him down in Return of the Jedi. So Palpatine sends Kylo Ren to find Rey, telling her, no, telling him, sorry, telling him to kill her, but knowing that he will only lead her to him on the Sith planet Exegol. When Kylo Ren finds Rey on the wreckage of the Death Star, the two battle it out over crashing waves. It's a direct parallel to the fight between Obi-Wan Kenobi and Anakin Skywalker and Mustafar at the end of Revenge of the Sith. That was the final moment for Anakin Skywalker. He died in the lava of Mustafar and was reborn as Darth Vader. The lightsaber duel between Rey and Kylo Ren took place not surrounded by lava and destructive force of fire, but surrounded by a symbol of life, water. While Anakin was lost and became evil at the end of this fight against his old friend and teacher Obi-Wan Kenobi, Kylo Ren was killed in this fight with Rey and became Ben Solo once again, thanks to Leia's intervention. Rey had a last minute opening and stabbed Kylo through the stomach and with his lightsaber, but because she had so much powerful feelings for him, moments later she uses the force to heal him. We saw her do this earlier with a sandworm, and even earlier this past week in The Mandalorian. It's also been a thing in the extended universe. This is the last straw for Kylo Ren, who is finally reclaimed from the dark side by this act of love and mercy, leading to a really heartwarming moment between him and his father, Han Solo. Ben Solo emerges the same way that Anakin Skywalker emerged so long ago. But there's another parallel that's even more interesting. In the end, when Rey is killed, destroying her grandfather, Ben Solo drags himself over to her, badly wounded himself, and holds her in his arms. He then places his hand on her stomach and brings her back to life. She opens her eyes and sees him and they kiss and he smiles. For the very first time in three films, it's a glorious moment. Then his eyes close and he slumps to the floor and dies, fading away into the forest. The important thing here to remember is why his grandfather, Anakin Skywalker, was able to return to the dark side in the first place. Palpatine convinced him that he could save Padme from death. He could save the one he loved by learning the ways of the dark side. His own master, Darth Plagueis, was able to bring back the dead, or so Palpatine told his soon-to-be pupil. Whether there was any truth to that remains a mystery. But Ben Solo was able to do what his grandfather was not. Bring back the one he loved from death, given all his life force to save hers. Not only a poetic moment and an emotionally powerful one, but a beautiful way to ref refute the lie Ray's grandfather told Ben's grandfather so many years prior. Weirdly, so many of the reviews for The Rise of Skywalker seem to ignore all of this, instead choosing to essentially take pointless sides in a pointless war over which movie is better, this one or The Last Jedi. It's almost as if critics are taking episode 9 personally, as though giving fans the kind of Star Wars happy ending they wanted to rebuke of The Last Jedi's more subversive tone, as if the Return of the Jedi's similar change in tone from Empire Strikes Back in any way diminished that movie. Now, I'm already 14 minutes into the video, so this is a very, 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 very long article, but I just wanted to tell you my thoughts about what I found in that article, and if you want to go to Forbes.com and check out that article, then you can if you want. So yeah, if you get a chance, please subscribe to my channel. You guys have a nice day. Thanks.